according to my computer clock, which is probably much similar to everybody else's. Um, I think that folks may continue to arrive. Um, so I'm going to mute everybody. Um, I don't know whether or not that has an effect on Bev or Carl or Karen, but it will um, eliminate dogs and all of those other uh, faithful friends that will join us um, and, and get us going. I'm really, really happy that everyone's here. Um, and Karen, um, you are muted. You can go ahead and no, you're not. Um, can you uh, give a few words about what it was that uh, inspired this evening, and then I can make uh, we can make some introductions. Sure, I'd love to. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. The idea for this question and answer session actually came from Sandy um, Boyd, and she. Um, thought it would be a great opportunity to bring experts, as we have here tonight, together in this forum to just answer some questions or listen to some comments that people maybe, store, maybe have stored up for the last couple of months of, as we've been sheltering in grace, as our current bishop calls it. So um, it's quite, kind, to, kind of going in two ways. We have um, the Reverend Canon um, Carl Andrews here tonight, who is very involved. He's the disaster director for the diocese and has been working with many other churches and sort of addressing this bigger picture issue of how it affects the church as a whole. And also tonight we have Bev White, who is a licensed counselor and therapist who has a private practice in um, Parker. And she deals with all sorts of issues. And I have um, confided in some people that I've been doing pretty well during this hunkering down, but I've noticed some anxiousness about things that I didn't realize I was anxious about. So. If you're like me or you have similar questions, Bev is here to sort of give us some common sense, listen to us and, you know, sort of, so we can all feel more comfortable in what we're doing now. Thanks, Karen. Um, let me just say that I'm, I'm very grateful to Karen and Bev and the congregational care team for imagining this evening. And I'm certainly very grateful to Carl Andrews for uh, graciously saying, "Oh yeah, I can do that," uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, uh, being available to talk about this. Carl has a wealth of experience in all sorts of different areas. Um, for those of you who don't know him, he was military chaplain, uh, command military chaplain. He's uh, dealt a lot with incredible uh, uh, strife situations. Uh, expert in PTSD and a lot of other things. So uh, the diocese is blessed to have him here advising our bishop and um, I'm blessed to be able to call him a friend. Um, so thank you, Carl. Thank you, Bev, for all of the work that you do in all of this. And again, thank you, Karen and the whole committee for um, pulling all of this together. Um, this is a Q and A and uh, I'm gonna let uh, Carl and Bev um, start off. I'm also here to answer questions certainly about how any of this has any effect on, on Good Shepherd and what's going on as the congregation moves forward. But if you have questions, um, I invite you to put them through into the chat function, um, and I will be paying attention to the chat function, and um, I, will get, I, I will try and get those questions to the appropriate person um, and make sure that they're out there. Um, I may or may not attach uh, your name to the question. It depends on whether it's, it seems to me like it's a, a, a general or a personal question and whether or not you would like to have your name attached. So anyway, um, I'll, um, I'm, I'll ask you to start, just say, if, uh, uh, you know, well, I'll just go ahead and say who you are, what, what's going on, what, what the perspective is from kind of the, the 30,000 foot, you were from Air Force, that's appropriate, uh, the 30,000 foot uh, perspective right now. 
Well, thank you, Gary. <clears throat> um, there, I think there are three major trains of information that we're all dealing with. Um, one of them is directly from the diocese. The other one is from CDC Colorado. And then we're all dealing with various inputs from parishioners and or friends. And because of those three different trends or those three different trains of information, we get confused in terms of where we're going as a diocese and as a parish and as a community. Uh, one of the things that <clears throat> I've been trying to do is help solidify that so that we don't have to go totally crazy um, because I think we are um, unintentionally uh, simply because we're being inundated with data that changes day in and day out or hour in and hour out. And, and that increases our anxiety or and our fear and or our excitement. Um, for example, there are many people in the High Plains that are saying, okay, we're going to open up on 7 to 14 June. Well, those are new dates that I'm totally unfamiliar with. Um, it's kind of like people are moving in directions simply because they're hearing things sometimes what they want to hear and sometimes that's what's being said. So I guess that's where I'd like to sort of start and welcome any questions, comments. Karen, I think you're next. Or Bev. So <clears throat> I've been seeing clients that are dealing also with that, with anxiety, a lot of uh, depression, anxiety, some fear about what's going to be happening. So having to work with people with change, um, also dealing with grief because we've lost the normalcy in our lives. We've lost our freedom. We're not being able to connect socially like we were before. So having to help people deal with the day to day, how is this going to look? no one really knows. So have, helping them to be able to deal with that, that they don't really know how it's going to, what's going to happen. We don't know when we can go back out. We don't know how it's going to look. So a lot of uncertainty, a lot of anxiety. Okay. And certainly from my standpoint, um, I'm hearing the, the anxiety, uh, Obviously, but I'm also hearing those questions about when do we go get to go back? What's it going to look like? Um, and Carl, you haven't heard me necessarily say this to everybody, but I keep saying it'll be what it'll be when it'll be. And the wardens and, and I will make the decision for Good Shepherd uh, when we believe that it is in the best interest of the congregation to move forward as we can. Um, recognizing that our situation is so much different than the situation in Uray or the situation in Sterling or even in the situation um, at St. Gregory's in, in, uh, in Littleton on the other side of the plat. Um, our situation is our situation. And uh, so um, I'm, I'm here to answer any kind of questions about those as well. So at this point, um, if you've got any questions, please, you know, shoot them through. I'm, I'm looking at the, at the, the chat feed and nobody has asked anything yet, which means I'm going to have to start telling jokes and we don't want that. To <laughs> or Carl, Carl will continue speaking in, in his Scottish world. And uh, unless you want to say either Bev or you, Carl, um, or Karen, um, want to sort of pitch in more. So what's up, what's on y'all's mind? And if the chat function doesn't work for you because you're on an iPhone um, or uh, a, a regular phone and, and typing doesn't work, just unmute yourself and we'll get you online. Oh, there's the chat. Carl, what guidelines for reopening are coming from the diocese? Uh, that's the current area we're trying to work on, and we're deliberately <clears throat> about two weeks behind anything that the governor suggests or wants to see for the houses of worship, uh, primarily because we want to see what peaks or doesn't peak immediately. 
I'll give you an example. Uh, upon the immediacy of opening restaurants in, in whatever social distancing process exists, I think if I was a, a restaurant owner somewhere else, I may want to wait a little bit to see what was happening within that immediate area. We as a diocese are doing exactly the same thing, and that is holding off in, in terms of trying to say, um, we need to see what changes happened in the peaks and valleys in terms of those who were hospitalized and ho those who had needs in between. Good, thank you. Um, I, that's kind of the message I've been trying to, to put across as well. Another, another um, question came in, how do we know, maybe this is um, a question for you, Bev, how do we know if our reaction is normal or if we are irrationally scared? If we are, what kind of scared? <laughs> irrationally. Oh, irrationally. Yeah. Okay, so um, everybody has some anxiety about this. This is happening to everybody around the world. So anxiety at this time, a little bit of anxiety is pretty normal. The way you could tell if it wasn't normal, if it's interfering with your daily routine, if it's interfering with your life, if you're not able to work, if you're not able to take care of your family, if you find yourself avoiding things that you normally like to do, then that would probably mean that it's time to talk to a mental health professional. So the way to decide if it's normal or not is if it's interfering with your life. Thank you. If, if anybody have follow-up, just, you know, type them in there. Um, another question came through is, uh, you know, I'm worried that seniors are being discriminated against in this current society. Just picking up this feeling, I'm afraid seniors will not be able to come back to church. I think that is a true um, emotional scenario that we need to address. Um, I'm one of those seniors myself. Um, I have multiple issues, um, and I'm aware of um, make my immune system pretty dicey at best. Um, and I'm fully aware of another diocesan bishop who has already said any 65-year-old clergy is not welcome back in their diocese to celebrate because he fears for their lives that clearly. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of age discrimination may be understood, but I think it needs to be put in a slightly different context, and that is risk analysis and what's safe. What's really safe? Is, is, it, a, is it an age discrimination, or what is safe for that individual? And I, for one, because of the, my own immune system, I've been an H1N1 candidate and hospitalized for over 10 days in the U.S. Air Force Hospital, um, you probably won't see me in the front pew when we reopen. I want to see how things go, because I think there could be a resurgence, and, and I think we need to be a little bit careful in that. Um, that kind of is a follow-on to the next question in terms of Thomas More, uh, who has started services with distancing, they've immediately bought into and accepted the governor's direction that said houses of worship could have 10 or less um, for mass. Um, we, the diocese, have deliberately, and again, I stress that, deliberately said we're going to be two weeks behind to see what's happening with the rest of the world, just to keep people safe. And if that seems like undue caution, then we're going to accept the criticism, and that's the way it is. I think, too, if I can just pick up on that, and, and I, um, I don't want to uh, make too broad a statement, but I think um, Catholic uh, spirituality has some slightly different bases than Anglican spirituality, and, and that that has some ramifications um, or questions of reopening as well. Um, what what we've argued, uh, I think, coming out of out of the bishop's office, and and certainly I'm totally in agreement with all of this, is 
that while the Eucharist is, is incredibly important and essential for Christians in general, there is a, a, a kind of spirituality that goes deeper than just that. That, that the body of Christ is the body of Christ when we are all together and the body of Christ is not a wafer or, or, or some wine. And so um, for many Roman Catholics, and again, I don't want to cast this too broadly, for many Roman Catholics, that's a distinction that is a little different than what we've been trying to make as, as the Episcopal Church. And um, so I, I just throw that on as a, a theological overlay to what, uh, what, what Carl already said. And you, you can disagree with me, Carl, but... <laughs> I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. Thank you. Um, Bev, what are, uh, what are suggestions for some tips to deal with anxiety with all of the unknown issues currently with which people are dealing? Okay, <clears throat> so there's a lot of different things you can do to help yourself with anxiety. A lot of coping skills, um, self-care, those kind of things. I kind of put together like a little acronym, REST, R-E-S-T. So the first one, R, is for routine. The, it's very important to keep your, in a routine that gives you a little bit of security. If you keep the same routine every day, it's good for you, it's good for your children, it's good for the whole family. So routine is important. The next one is exercise. Exercise is good for everything. <laughs> exercise is good for anxiety, depression, your physical health, your mental health. So walking, um, anything that you can do in your home, any kind of exercise. So making sure that you get that in, hopefully every day, 30 minutes, whatever to help you. So routine, exercise. The next one is self-care. And self-care are things like yoga, meditation, music, time to take care of yourself. And I think it's also important for people to help their children find that time as well. Sometimes we don't realize they need some of the same things that we need. So the last one is just time for you. Being able to say, I'm gonna take this half hour in this part of the house all by myself. And I'm gonna take a little space and a little time for reflection or whatever I need. So REST is a good way to start. That's a good way to kind of help you get, sort of calm down and manage that anxiety. Well said, Bev. Very <laughs> well said. Thank you. Is there any best way to deal with those who refuse to acknowledge the seriousness of this disease and keep distance, wear masks, etc., exposing others, potentially more uh, vulnerable individuals, both ourselves and others, without putting yourself at risk of additional exposure or retaliation? I'm a little verbal when it comes to those situations, and I've had, yes, as Gary well knows, I somewhat am. Um, when Lynn and I prepared for the El Camino, which we did in November, we were doing 15 miles a day on the Highline Canal. I can't go to the Highline Canal today because there are people that refuse to do those two actions. They will not keep distance. They will not keep masks. So I need to find another way to be able to deal with that. And so my method of dealing with it is we're walking in the neighborhood and we're crossing the street. And when somebody refuses to acknowledge those two things, I'm a little verbal in terms of saying, um, I would appreciate some distance and seeing you're not wearing a mask. I am, and I'm going over here. I may love you, but um, you're putting me at risk and I'd just as soon not put somebody else at risk later. I built a little bit of a script, and so I can be able to address it and feel comfortable saying that out loud. Bev, any other suggestions you might pose? No, I like, I like what you said. That's a great way to do it. A lot of times I just cross to the other side and I don't, I'm not very verbal. <laughs> so I like, I, I like that. <laughs> I guess my problem is, as Gary will tell you, 32 plus years in the military tends to make me a little different. I'm sorry. No, it's great. A, a question came in um, to me. Um, 
uh, about what are my joys and or concerns that are related to the life of Good Shepherd. And um, I, I, I wrote back and said, do you want me to share this publicly or not? And um, the questioner said, well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think my concerns um, for the congregation are that we recognize in some respects what Carl was just saying is that this is not just about us as individuals. This is about us as a community. And, and as we move forward um, as Good Shepherd, um, decisions made about uh, reopening, um, social distancing and all of those kinds of things, those are really about how do we as individuals see ourselves in relationship to the greater body? Um, and, and to use this sort of Pauline metaphor, uh, you know, you can't say that one member of the body can do something without affecting the rest of the body. And, and so for the congregation, I guess my, my hopes and my, my concerns are that we continue to make decisions that I will as, as, as the, uh, the pastor, continue to make decisions based on what's good for the whole congregation. And um, many of you who've been paying attention to the, to the book Canoeing Mountains may recognize the um, idea that came through from there is that, you know, it's, it's the leader's job to disappoint people up to the level that they can handle. And, you know, and so my job is to disappoint you when you want to get back together because it's necessary for the health of the body. For individuals to be disappointed that we just can't get together until it's good for everybody. And so I, I think my hope and concern is that the congregation really sees that and owns it, is that we are the body of Christ and that when one member of the body is not healthy, then none of us are healthy and we need to do everything we can to bring the whole health of the body back. Um, and so I hope that answers that question. Uh, so, moving down the line here. Yeah, let me um, chime in for a second, Gary. Chime um, in, Paul. Uh, two people I'm involved in, in the Episcopal Relief and De Development Disaster Team, and this is something that we deal with minimum two or three times a week for extensive Zoom calls. And the, the point I'd like to simply make is two of the people are, one is a senior lay leader, in Seattle, the other is the priest at Ground Zero where the nursing home stuff blew. Uh, that's Patty Baker. And, and what I'm trying to say in the midst of that is um, they've done things very slowly. They've addressed conversation slowly. This is not, let's run back to the old normal life. Let's look at the new normal life and what does it look like? And, and they've taken it very carefully because, uh, as Patty Baker says bluntly, she said, you know, I've lost 17 members of my parish in the nursing home, um, and, and which are really startling kinds of pieces of data to deal with. And it's sort of they're dealing with it very slowly. And the last thing that Dave Baker sort of threw at me was, he said, uh, our diocese is saying bluntly, no more singing, period. No more wind instruments, period. Um, it's fine for, you know, string and keyboard, but we are not going to take those kind of risks. And that's the Diocese of Washington that's making those decisions. I'm not saying those are imposed on Colorado. But I'm just saying, when you start looking at the subject of saying, let us be the body of Christ again in a physical place, please, please don't rush. Yeah, the, the, the question of singing also came up. Um, one of, one of the groups of, the, of singers in the congregation said, may not be able to sing for 18 months or two years. Um, uh, singing in a group is a way to spread the virus. And that is what we're seeing. And, uh, you know, for, for a congregation, now I will say this to y'all, uh, we did this dots exercise a year or so ago 
when what's important to Good Shepherd and music was so strong um, and music, especially and, and, and coupled with worship and those two things, singing is, is just incredibly important. And, and so what a loss. Um, and uh, another question that's related not to singing, but the question is, how do we handle loss? Here's this, this question came from a Eucharistic visitor. Um, I can't, I can't take communion to shut-ins. And how do we talk to the shut-ins? How do we, how do we address the loss? Um, not only from our own sense of being able to be with people, for, but how do we help those folks address um, the loss of, of that connection with us, whether it's just the Eucharist or um, being able to physically be with somebody who's caring for them? Um, I'll throw that out to both uh, Bev and Carl. <laughs> Okay, that's a hard. So loss is definitely what a lot of people are feeling. So grieving, people are really grieving at this point. Loss of normalcy, loss of freedom, all of those things are happening at the same time. And so being able to feel that feeling, not deny it, not push it down, not pretend like it's not there, but go ahead and feel that feeling and then try to move on to what the next step is and what, the, what it's going to look like when we go the next step from here. So reassuring those people through phone calls, video, any way that you can connect with the people that are missing you and missing Eucharist, being able to at least do that part of it. I, I know when Karen goes, she does a lot of information when she goes to visit and, and she does the Eucharist. She talks about the sermon, she talks about biblical things. And so maybe at least giving them that part of it helping to do it in that way, even though you can't physically do the Eucharist. I would piggyback on Bev's remarks, and that is maybe it's a situation where more frequent communication is made from that Eucharistic visitor to those individuals. Mm -hmm. um, I understand very clearly the sense of gap, communication, loss, and... and uh, there isn't any way necessarily to physically bridge that gap, but maybe uh, more conversation could assist. Um, I'm going to go back to the singing side of things just for a moment. Um, the government in Germany has gone as far as to say there will be no singing in any church, synagogue, or mosque, period, because of the impact that it's had on their people. I don't think we've reached that point, but um, singing does have its effect. Carl, um, not on the singing point, but I, I remember something that you sent across maybe to the clergy of the diocese. Um, your experience as uh, being in the field with the military um, and, and the inability or the absence of, of communion, being able to do that, uh, led you to um, recall some other historical ways of thinking about how you maintain that sort of Eucharistic um, sensibility without body and blood physically. Can, can you speak to that? A, a bit? Yeah, I can actually. Um, thank you, Gary. One of the time frames when I was in Vietnam for actually for quite a period of time before I was even welcomed to the altar by a bunch of Romans after about four months. And um, we had no Episcopal priests. In the back of the Armed Forces prayer book, there is a short prayer that has to deal with spiritual communion of how to receive communion when you are absent from the table. Um, the, the, the Armed Forces prayer book, Episcopal, is a very, very short little book uh, it's been around since World War I, and um, us military types, we've used it in all kinds of scenarios. Um, Gary, if you don't have that prayer, I will make certain that you do. Um, it, it's uh, very accessible, and it's actually been reused since I started to pound on that table with the um, bishops in the church. Um, they're using it within multiple different dioceses. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I have it somewhere, but and I'm sure I can find it. But uh, if you want to send it to me again, that might be <laughs> that might be good. a little easier. Yeah, thank sure. you. Um, I'm not. 
I'm not proposing that this would work for our church, but I'd like to share with you something that works in Montgomery, Alabama for my mother and for my sister's church, which is a Methodist church, Fraser Memorial. My mother has bed, been bedridden for several years and the church there has its own uh, TV channel. And on Sunday, they do, uh, the pastor there asks everyone who wants to share communion to have a piece of bread or a piece of cracker and some bread or so, some wine or some what juice or whatever. And during the service, he actually offers them the opportunity to share communion with the church. And that's very meaningful for her. Carl, can you speak to that, especially yeah. coming out of the office of the bishop? Yeah, that's not a position that Bishop Kim is willing to go. So here we have a, a, a distinction between um, theological stances of one church and another. And, you know, that, 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 that's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, I understand that. And I was just offering what was meaningful to for her and what works for them in Montgomery, Alabama, in the Methodist Church. Sure. Sure. Which I completely get, and Bishop Kim's desire, real bottom desire for the Diocese of Colorado, is that when we share Eucharist, we do it as both collegiately and across the diocese. That nobody moves ahead of the other simply because it's easier or something in response. It's something we do as a community of faith. And, and I think, you know, that's part of the challenge that we're all going to face. It, I was on a, um, we had a clergy gathering earlier, clergy gathering earlier today. And uh, uh, it was, it was of the front range clergy. And uh, what, what I had to remind folks was that the front range clergy, which is Denver and Arapaho and um, including Parker and Elbert County, we're all in the same state, so the governor may say, this can happen in the state, but we already know that um, Douglas County is doing its thing, and Arapahoe County um, and Denver County are doing their thing, and I, I still don't know what Elbert is doing. You know, so how, I, I, I'm not asking you this question, Carl, but the question is, how do we do things collegially um, when we have multiple judicatories uh, governmental judicatories who are telling us that this is possible and this isn't possible. So I, I think, you know, it, it's a real challenge, um, not only in the Episcopal Church, but when we start looking across denominational boundaries. And some of this has, as I alluded to earlier, some of this has to do with, with our theological underpinnings about what communion is. And so, you know, doing communion, um, when there isn't the body present, and I mean the body of Christ, that being all of us, sin is, is a different theological statement than um, taking an aseptic little cup of, of, of bread and, and grape juice and putting it on top of your TV and saying, well, now it's been blessed. I mean, those are very, very different theological concepts. And um, the Episcopal Church has stood firmly and not just at this point but in other times saying the, the communion is communion it's everybody together the body of christ is made real in the bread and the wine but it is all of us together that are doing that and so i think that you know that's the that's the challenge that we're facing is we're seeing other people with other theologies doing other stuff and we say why can't we be like them because we are episcopalians Well, uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, um, this, this coming from, uh, from a senior in high school, I missed celebrating my senior year with graduation. How can we acknowledge and support those with a loss of a rite of passage? <laughs> if I was in, in responding to that question, Mine would simply be, how can I put their picture and their story in front of my parish? Yep. Yep. Any ideas, Bev? 
No, the only ideas I have are the ones you're already seeing that the communities are doing the, the parades, the car parades, and people are coming out and sort of saying congratulations to these people. And just kind of, that's the only thing I can think of that you could do at this point because they can't really gather, they can't get together, they can't do anything except what we're doing. They can get on Zoom. <laughs> and I will say that I have been in, uh, for those of you who are members of Good Shepherd, you know, Rachel Whip and I have been in conversation. Um, and that was not a, a Zoom slowdown conversation <laughs> about how um, how we can do this and uh, without uh, um, uh, presaging things too much because then the surprise element is gone. Um, we're working on it. <laughs> she already told me about it. Okay, all right, well, thanks. Uh, we're, we're, we're figuring it out. Um, and you know the other side side of all of this, and and this is related and not related to the issue of of um, transitions. We're coming up on Pentecost. We're going to have another major feast of the church um, within you know eight weeks uh, of of Holy Week. Another major festival of the church that is going to be done with twenty five people on a screen. This is how we're watching it. And, you know, so the areas and levels of disappointment are great. And um, I am certainly not unaware of all of that, um, whether it's um, uh, high school, college graduation, whether it's family vacations, whether it's not being able to be with family members who are uh, dying, whether it has to do with COVID or something else. I mean, we are in a very very we're weird world and disappointment is um coloring it all so um yeah that, that's just really hard um when and how will church preschools and child care <coughs> open? if they open this fall is that too early can it be done safely great question uh, what's what's the council coming out of the office of the bishop carl I'm going to go a little different direction. My daughter is at Patrick Air Force Base, and the Child Development Center has not reopened as of yet. And she needs the Child Development Center for her five-year-old and one-year-old. And she is seriously wondering how long both of the children will live. Because she is just going absolutely crazy in terms of doing her full-time job electronically and trying to care for two children. So that question is really very valuable and important. Um, we have one child care center that is diocesan related that is already working on reopening, uh, but it's still under the, the mandate of being 10 or less. And it has to be 10 or less in different configurations so that the children and the um, individual who is caring for them can everybody be safe and the, the requirements to keep that location sanitized are just awkward to put it politely um, in terms of saying how long it's sort of like asking the question how long is it before our children can go back to school and, and which is something that I know Hundreds of thousands of parents would just love to have the answer because they want them out from away from them because they cannot motivate them anymore. They're just tired. So yes, yeah. that's not a good answer. Um, and if, if you have any great ideas, please let me know. <laughs> my, my son, um, I, uh, this morning uh, said, gosh, I'm done with school. This is the weirdest end of finals that I've ever had and probably will ever have, but I'm not quite sure how it feels any different than what it was last week because things are, are so different. And, you know, and he's 17. He's, he just finished his junior year in high school. Um, but when you're thinking about smaller kids and all of those um, issues that parents have, you know, I've, I've certainly seen that. When when we think about moving back into the building, though, 
you know, and I raised this question with our staff um, yesterday at the staff meeting, you know, given our Sunday school spaces in the building, how are we going to, you need to think now and let us know, are those rooms too small for social distancing? And if so, what does Sunday school look like? What does curriculum look like if it's godly play and there's a lot of manipulation and manipulation um, of, of, um, of physical objects? You know, so all of those, you know, what are we gonna do in the nursery? Um, and, and Susan, my wife, brought up the really good point. Children are not being asked to wear masks because they aren't leaving house and going into the, into the grocery store. How are we all of a sudden going to make these kids wear masks? You know, so the, the level of, of depth that, that we, that's necessary for us to address, you know, in, in opening things back up to normal, and there will never be that kind of normal again, um, are, are really, really, really large. Um, so I don't know what we're going to do. It's, it's, uh, we're working on it. Uh, thank you for the question, because it is something that we are very, very definitely trying to address. I know other churches are trying to address it as well. Um, but, you know, it, it's curriculum. It's, uh, we also recognize who are going to be the first persons that want to come back to church? Parents with their kids. <laughs> because the parents with kids are least vulnerable, according to the demographic side, and they're the ones who most need to get their kids handed off to somebody else, uh, you know, to, to, for a little bit of, of, of time. So we know that this is a, a real issue. And, oh, golly, again, to echo Carl, if you've got any great ideas, let us know. Can um, I chime in? Sure, please. I've taken some early childhood education classes. Um, I took them this year for high school, and um, I was in a preschool classroom in, from January till school closed. And what they're doing now is they're still doing, they're still meeting, and they're having like one social time where they can just talk back and forth. And seeing these three-year-olds try to talk back and forth is hysterical. <laughs> um, <laughs> But they also then get to work on their skills like speech because a lot of the kids who go to this public school are on IEPs. And so they needed help working on speech or they needed help working on how to walk properly. Like it just, they still need those skills. So the teachers are trying to do like an impossible job to help the parents, help the kids when the parents don't have the training that the teachers do. Thank you, Emma. Gary, this, this is yeah. Kathy Conley. I, I want to go back to the very fact that our graduates haven't been able to celebrate. Is there any way that we could do like in a newsletter, get a picture of each one of them, where they went to school, where they're going to go to college, uh, just a little bit and send it out like we do the newsletter to the parish? Thanks. Great idea. We can, we can, uh, I'll, I'll pass that on to Rachel. You know, we can do some nice little graphics and make it, you know, balloons and all that. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Emma's shaking her head. <laughs> something, you know, I understand it's not what we'd like. I did a drive by for my grandson's 13th birthday. And, you know, a one car parade. Yeah, yeah, I understand. I think if, if any of you are like me, you, you're spending a lot of time walking around the neighborhoods. And I walked by a house the other day, and I, you know, it's not in, uh, these are not, are not people I know. And, you know, when you walk by houses, you see these signs up that say, Congratulations, graduate, you know. Uh, Joe in our house is, you know, he's a, a 2020 graduate from Creek. I walked by this house, and there were three signs. And I don't know, they were all graduating from Creek. So is this triplets? And I thought, wow, <laughs> what a celebration that these folks are missing. You know, it's so, yeah, it, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty significant. Um, uh, as a suggestion to graduation, care packages be delivered to high school graduates, uh, Zoom together. 
uh, on a predetermined date. Again, I, those are issues that I'll pass on to Rachel. Um, kids under two should not wear masks. It's a safety factor for several different reasons. Um, how much of this do we have to, you know, who knew? Who knew we were gonna be talking about this? We did not know. Um, so uh, when, when I, I talk to my colleagues and I'm sure that Carl hears this, he's already alluded to it, um, who say, woohoo, we can get back in church on Trinity Sunday. Um, and, and other people hear about that. Ain't gonna happen at Good Shepherd. We are not gonna have all of these pieces in place. Um, because we might we might uh, uh, get a lot of it down, but it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Uh, we'll get some of these taken care of and then something else is gonna pop up. And we want to really make sure that our um, our members all feel confident. We've grown accustomed, whether we like it or not, we've grown accustomed to Zoom worship for the last eight weeks. Um, and as, as I said in my video thing the other day, um, if you don't get communion, if you can't sit any closer than six feet away from somebody, if there's no coffee hour and you can't sing, you may as well be at home <laughs> um, <laughs> until, we can, until we can alleviate some of those kind of concerns that, that uh, what, what really brings us to church. Um, I had a question that was addressed to me um, about theology and, and the theology of the Eucharist uh, that's underneath how I see us thinking doing things at Good Shepherd. Um, thanks, uh, Sandy, for, for raising that, that, that issue. And, and, you know, the theology of the Eucharist, what, what we do, and I'm not going to get into transubstantiation and all that kind of stuff, because that's, I've talked about that way too much in, in other contexts. But what we do when we gather together is we offer ourselves. The bread and wine are our offerings to God, and God consecrates them and gives them back to us. And yes, that's incredibly powerful. And it's something we do as a community, as an incredibly powerful symbol of what we bring to give to God. But God gives that back to us and says, now go do something. And we are in a place right now where we have been fed at that table week after week after week with what we have given God. And God is giving it back to us and say, go do something we now get to go do something. And pretty soon, we'll have an opportunity to say, this is what we've done with what you've given us. And God will say, great, go do something. You know, it's so the theology of the Eucharist to me is we are the body of Christ because we take in the body and blood of Christ, but it's not just some sort of magical thing that flips a switch in us and says, well, now you're better. If anything, it's a magical switch that flips in us and says, now go do something. Because Jesus didn't come to give us a piece of bread and a sip of wine. Jesus came to empower us to go out and change the world. And believe, oh, we all know the world needs to be changed right now. And, and we've got people on either side of us in, in our neighborhoods that are hurting, that need our engagement. Um, in ways that Jesus would like us to show. And it's not all about us being able to have, as a, as a professor in seminary told me, a taste of pace and a sip of juice. Um, I, I don't want to demean that. I love the Eucharist. I have, a, I have a friend in California, and I called him on his birthday a few weeks ago, he said, what are you doing about the Eucharist? And I said, I'm not doing it by myself. But this isn't about me. This is about the community. This is about the gathered body of Christ that becomes the body of Christ around that table and is fed at that table. Um, so I don't know, Sandy, if that answers your question. Uh, she's nodding. So um, that's, that's where I come from theologically on this. Um, Good. This Good is an important, important issue. Bread and wine, body and blood are important issues, but they're not the only way we are the body of Christ. Um, what we do on a Sunday, a normal Sunday morning for the last 40 years has been the sacrament of word and the sacrament at the table. And now we get to focus on the sacrament of the word and letting Jesus 
be in us through his presence in scripture. Good shepherd, you have a real priest. Thanks, Carl. Uh, theologically sound priest who gets it. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Carl. Um, another uh, statement that came through is uh, um, this, this from Emma. I'm just going to out you again. Emma, our, our uh, graduating uh, senior here who for whom this is a real issue. One thing the diocese has done for high school seniors is offer a time to talk through how we feel and how we can get through it together. I think that that's real for this congregation is how can we get through this together. And I hope that's what you've been hearing me say for the last six weeks is we, it's not me, it's us. you got to pick up the phone and call somebody else. This is all us um, getting through this together. Um, another person wrote in, it's easy to focus on our own discomforts, uh, but let us remember those who are suffering economically and may not recover, those people are certainly in our community and probably in our church. Um, thoughts, Bev, Carl, anybody on, on uh, this is sort of an outreach related question. Um, and I, I, I will just say, and then I'm going to shut up. Um, that the question of how do you do outreach when you're limited to Zoom, when, when you feel like you're limited to Zoom, is a real question. Um, it's, it's hard to bring people into the church uh, because we got limits. Do you know the password? <laughs> um, it, it, it's hard to reach out. Um, and any thoughts um, that, that uh, Carl, you're hearing coming out of the office of the bishop? Um, Anybody else to, to chime in? Well, I do know that I'm entertaining and working on an Episcopal Relief and Development Grant to go to food banks right now. Okay. In the Diocese of Colorado. Though that area is something that seriously concerns me because um, they're being strapped. I mean, literally being strapped. Uh, the good news in that particular thing is various communities said, okay, we're going to only have one food bank that we're going to push everything towards so that we can take care of this community. And, and some of the other rural communities on the Western Slope uh, are down to zip. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a strange catch-22 in the sense that the resources coming into the food banks, especially financial resources, are, are uh, affected by the fact that people who, whose jobs have been uh, either furloughed or laid off no longer have those financial resources to give to the food banks. And then they're, they're coming in and saying, we need the resources of the food banks. So it's, uh, it, it's a real uh, catch-22. Um, Bev, do you um, have some insight on not resolving the food bank issue? But, but the issue of, of our own feelings of inadequacy, of, of addressing a, a, a situation like this, you know, we're all strapped with dealing with our own families and our own family issues. Some of us may have lost um, income because of this. And yet, because of our Christian commitment, we want to be able to deal with everybody else, but we can't. And, and so we feel... Uh, troubled on the side that we're not dealing with our family and we can't deal with these other folks. Do you have, do you have some insight on that? Um, I have insight that I feel that way sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that I want to do more than I can at times and, and because of being a high, in a high-risk population, I can't run out and do the things I would normally do. So I, I think we're all feeling that. I think we're all feeling like we wish we could do more and we we kind of have this feeling that our neighbor's doing a better job than we are. <laughs> and so trying to kind of accept yourself for where you are and, and that nobody's doing this perfectly. We're all walking through this and learning as we go. So finding ways you can, whatever it is you can do, if it's connecting to your neighbor, even just in any way to just say, Hey, how are you? How are you? Okay. Is there anything I can do for you and find out maybe their situation? I've had neighbors, 
actually do that for me as well. Is, you know, how are you guys doing? Is there anything you need? So because I can't really go out and do for them, I can at least talk to them or connect with them and maybe connect them with somebody who can help them. But I think we're all feeling that kind of loss of how do I help the people who can't help themselves? And donating to the food bank is great. That's one way to do it. Um, connecting to your neighbors is another way. Just making sure that you do whatever you can do. Phoning those people you haven't talked to in a while. Checking in on people that you know aren't able to get out or making sure they can get out. I think that's all that we can do at this point. Um, question came in and, and I recognize it's getting close to eight and we don't want to keep um, somebody wants to can I speak to this for a please, second? Please. And that is, at this particular point, people are all going to be able to forgive us for making mistakes as we try to do things. But they won't forgive us if we do nothing. Because they will not hear the message of Jesus in the do nothing aspect. Doing something is exactly like Bev just finished saying. Reaching out, touching, communicating, and the like. But if we sit on our hands, I'm not impressed with what my Lord will say when I get to the front door of the pearly gates. He will be saying, Andrews, what the were you doing? <laughs> Sorry, not direct. Thank you, Carl. Uh, it's that military side of you being a director. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, um, it's a bad uh, part. Just a couple more questions, and, and then we'll cut this off because I I, I know that it's it's close to eight. Um, Carl, has the diocese discussed possible loss of parishioners due to the Zoom service? And and let me just preface that by saying I haven't seen a whole lot of loss at Good Shepherd in terms of people showing up for worship. But, you know, what's the issue uh, from the diocesan side point? Um, they're actually seeing 180 degrees. It's an increase in evangelism. There are more parishioners, if you will, that have said, oh, thank God you've given me an opportunity to come back to church. I couldn't drive or I couldn't do this. Uh, it was inconvenient, and now, thank you, Jesus, I'm back at the table. Um, parish after parish is repeating the same statement of, I'm here. Uh, take X parish today, and they were saying, <clears throat> well, I had people that I haven't seen for 300 years. Uh, two of them are in Germany, and the other ones are in Assisi. Yep. Yep. We're, we're getting people... Um, connecting with us from Germany, from South Africa, from out of state, uh, you know, so it, it does provide that opportunity. Um, a comment here about food banks, Covenant Cupboard, one of our uh, uh, normal outreach opportunities, normally serves 100 uh, or less families. Recently, it's been more like 150. And, um, you know, Covenant Cupboard is, is uh, a mile from my house. It's located in Greenwood Village and or, uh, you know, the, the tech center, we are not talking about an economically disadvantaged neighborhood. And they're seeing, um, you know, a 50% increase in folks. So that's, that, that is so clearly um, a, a need. Um, another question came in, has anyone considered connecting with the secular community through Facebook Live video? My, my uh, I don't know what's, what the um, office of the bishop is saying in this, I, th I think that that question um, relates to just sort of the larger question of the church relating to the outside world. We're coming up um, <laughs> this coming Sunday. Uh, the lessons are Paul at the Areopagus uh, talking to um, all of these folks on uh, in, in Athens who have no clue uh, what, what Christianity is about. It is that uh, invitation to engage with the culture. And um, I don't know whether Facebook Live is the answer or Zoom is the answer. I would say that the church has been dealing with that particular question um, 
mightily for the last 40 or 50 years um, as uh, you know, the sort of post baby boom, post 60s secularization, whatever you want to call it. You know, how do we reach that group of people who aren't interested in what the church has to say? I don't know. I don't know if there's a, if there's a great answer. Um, any any great ideas, Carl? Uh, the biggest fear that I keep hearing from folks in different places is that the virtual church will disappear when we have the opportunity to come back together. Um, that it has reached so many people <laughs> that it's an opportunity where we have to relook at how we reach people and how we communicate the message of Jesus. And I hope and pray that parishes will be able to do both because I think that the church at large will grow and grow and grow because of that. Any other questions coming in? <clears throat> Well, thank you, Bev. Thank you, Carl. Um, thank you for all of you who have um, <clears throat> had questions in. I will close us with a prayer and say good night um, to you all. Let us pray. Oh God, you have made of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your blessed Son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. Grant that people everywhere may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations into your fold, pour out your spirit upon all flesh, and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here. Thanks, Bev. Look forward to seeing you all soon in some other Thanks venue. Carl and Bev and Karen and Gary. Yep. I'm, I'm going to unmute everybody. You all can natter on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I was going to say, if um, it, let's keep the dialogue going. So if anyone has ideas or questions, feel free to let the Congregational Care Ministry know. Father Gary, no, and we'll organize something else. Thank you, Gary. Thank, thank you for an opportunity to share my evening glass of wine with each of you. <laughs> red or white? Where is it? I don't see it. Disinfectant. Red or white? Carl, the question is red or white? Yes. White? Is it gone? <laughs> Can you share? Bless you all. All right. Blessings. Good night, John. Good night. Good night, all. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.